Hey everyone, welcome back to the Going Scared podcast. This is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the world-changing brand Noonday Collection. Join me here every week for conversations that encourage you to live a life of purpose by leaving comfort and going scared. Well, we've taken a little break from the Going Scared podcast. We had an amazing Enneagram series over the summer, and I hope you've had the chance to listen to that. Before our last series on the Enneagram, we were previously in a series that was all about habits, and that series is what has inspired this next short mini-series. We're calling it the Myth Busting Series. I remember in the habit series learning that water it doesn't actually impact how your skin appears. And yet, washing your face, it does. We learned about so many things that I thought maybe didn't matter that really do. And I think there's a lot of beliefs that we carry around that, are they actually true? I mean, does a wet head outside actually cause a cold? I don't know, guys. I grew up with my mom telling me that, but I think that actually might be a myth. So we're going to start off by myth-busting ideas that we might have around nutrition. There are so many myths out there floating around on social media, on blogs. You can't have this oil. Does organic really matter? How much exercise is really effective? There's keto. There is the 30-day cleanse. There is the South Beach. And I have discovered a nutritionist named Dr. Adrian Chavez, and I have come to really appreciate his perspective. It is all science-based nutrition. In fact, he previously has his degree and he has a master's in public health, as well as 10 years of PhD experience in nutrition. He's a specialist in nutrition for weight loss, wellness, and various chronic diseases. And he shares science-based information to better live a healthier and happier life. His personal mission is to help people improve their well-being and prevent or reverse chronic diseases using science-based nutrition and lifestyle strategies. I love this conversation today. I just started just shooting questions at him right and left, and he was prepared with an answer. I am quite sure today that you are going to have some myths that you carry around busted. Give it a listen. Super excited to have you on the show, Dr. Adrian Chavez. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Gretchen Rubin. She talks a lot about habits. And I've had her on the show a couple of times, and she divides habit people into four different categories. And one of them is a questioner. And that if you're a questioner, you're not going to do something until you have really figured it out, asked all the questions. Maybe you're a tiny bit cynical. Well, guess what I guess what I am? I'm a questioner. Yes, yes. That sounds exactly like me as well. (laughs) Okay, so we're going to have a great talk today. And I cannot think of a topic that makes causes more questions to arise, more myths that are out there, misinformation, or things that I don't even know. I just don't even know than there is the nutrition. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's that's really what got me into this field in the first place was the level of complexity and the number of questions. Like I knew I'm just a, a endlessly curious person. And when I first started getting into nutrition to me, because I, w- I had a master's degree in exercise science before this, uh, nutrition was like, wow, this is so much more complicated and I'll never figure it out. So this is the direction that I want to go. Well, I know you went on also to get your degree in master's of public health. And I'm curious how that has informed you today. Yeah, definitely look at uh, nutrition from a different lens than a lot of people. I don't necessarily take just the individual approach. Um, I, I definitely see things from a policy level, environmental level, like we have to look at nutrition from multiple different levels beyond just the individual choices that we have on a day-to-day basis, because even those are largely influenced by factors that are outside of our control. 
and things that we sometimes don't realize. And, and that can be a big factor when it comes to our choices. Well, what I love about your voice, and by the way, you're an Instagram discovery. Instagram is not all bad. I, it brought me you. And you're just super grounded and pragmatic. And I think with health, especially in health, has to do with so many things. It has to do with our habits. It has to do with our view of ourselves. I mean, trauma. I mean, it, it encompasses everything. But we make it so complicated when it's like, oh my gosh, if we were just drinking water and moving our body and just putting whole foods in, in our bodies most of the time, like we would be healthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you just broke down uh, most of my message, basically. <laughs> uh, you know, I went to school for, for a decade, and now all I tech, talk to people about on, on social media, for the most part, and, and in podcasts and interviews is just exactly what you said. Like, it really, most of us, um, it really comes down to those simple things that in their habits, habits that we need to just establish and get very consistent with, and almost none of us are consistent with regular sleep, you know, a good stress management practice, eating uh, healthy, balanced meals throughout the day and, and not snacking, you know, between meals too much because you're skipping meals, you know, just just these simple things that are, um, they're not fancy, they're not sexy, they're not uh, gonna, they're not gonna excite make you a whole anyone. lot of money, Adrian. They're not gonna make you a whole lot of money. <laughs> that's it. That's exactly what it is. At the end of the day, unfortunately, from my perspective and from perspective of people, you know, in my field, if you're if you're trying to break into this field and make a bunch of money, um, telling people to you know eat more fruits and vegetables isn't the way to do it. Right, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Which, by the way, I have to tell you, two of the habits I've incorporated since following you are just taking a walk when I can after a meal, just like a, and not some put on my biker shorts walk, but just kind mm. of strolling for just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, any any amount, any amount of movement that we get, you know, a lot of us focus a lot on exercise and exercise is great. Exercise is important, but we, a lot of us overlook the the small amounts of movement that we can get throughout the day that really add up. And, and in many cases can, can uh, attribute to more calorie burn than exercise and also just more health benefits than exercise from a mental standpoint as well. Like sometimes we just need to get out and move a little bit to clear our mind. It's so true. It's so true. And I think there are days where I might get just a really hard, good workout in, but then s literally sit the rest of the day. And then there are days where my job is requires a ton of activity. And I'm like, I definitely got more exercise and burned more calories on those days. Yeah. Yeah. That's like I said, that's one of the biggest things that people overlook is, you know, just getting out and going to like a theme park on the weekends and, and just moving all day is going to really account for more energy expenditure, but then just health benefits in general. And we really need to, um, in my opinion, and this is one of the messages that I try to, uh, you know, communicate through my Instagram is really just focusing more on those types of lifestyle based activities and building out a more active life versus, you know, we go to the gym for 30 minutes, but then, you know, the rest of our day is mostly sedentary. That's right. Okay. So we're going to break down a few myths. Myth number one, sugar is addictive. Okay. So this, uh, when you see this on social media, typically people are going to show, there's a couple of different studies that they'll refer to. And one of them, they're talking about mice where they'll compare, they'll say, well, when they gave mice sugar versus when they gave them cocaine, uh, the mice wanted the sugar more. And so this is why, you know, sugar is just as addictive or worse than cocaine. When you see that, that is so misleading because um, clearly they're going to want the sugar more. It's it's what their body needs to live like. They're going to go for sugar over cocaine because sugar is fuel and their body is going to uh, die if they stay, you know, if they just go for the cocaine. So I see that one. And I also see another uh, a visual that's shown very often where they show two brains and they'll say, this is your brain on cocaine and this is your brain on sugar. And, and they'll use that as a justification for, for claiming that sugar is as addictive as cocaine, when the reality is that sugar is a primary fuel source for our brain. So when we eat sugar, that's going to cause more activity in our brain. Does that mean it's addictive? No, that means it's it, we definitely experience a reward uh, from eating sugar because that's biologically, that's what keeps us alive. And that comparison is just, it's disingenuous the way that people make that comparison because it's a fuel source and it's causing the brain to light up because it's 
providing energy for the brain or it's causing, you know, more activity in the brain because it's providing energy, not because it's, you know, quote unquote addictive. And the reality is that we don't see like with with the properties of what would be considered addiction, where there would be withdrawals when you stop having sugar, like we don't see these um, really play out the way that it does with a true addiction. Um, and the reason that this claim bothers me uh, specifically is because uh, it turns eating into uh, this really horrible thing. Like we start to uh, associate like having a donut with our kids on Sunday morning with. I mean, a you know, donut. I mean, a <laughs> banana if you've been on yeah, keto. Like, exactly. Like banana, um, I, I had to get over that banana. I can eat a banana. <laughs> that, see, that's that's the part for me. Um, you know, there's a little bit of truth to it because yes, if we eat a lot of sugar, our, you know, our body starts to get primed to want that reward and we we will um, tend to eat a little bit more and crave it more. But using the terminology of addiction is really doing more harm than good for many people because it's creating this this idea that that food is is a drug and it's something that we need to be scared of. And and really, at the end of the day, that's that's doing more harm than good from a mental health standpoint. So what is your philosophy on sugar? Uh, so as long as you're not overeating. So sugar is, it, it's, you know, it's, it's very calorie dense. So if you have a tablespoon of sugar, it's going to have a lot of calories and it's not going to fill you up very much. So if you're eating a lot of sugar, like added sugar, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause you to eat more calories and probably not fill you up. So if that contributes to you overall eating more calories throughout the day, that's probably going to be an issue. If it doesn't, let's say you ate you know, 150 grams of sugar from, from different sources that, that had added sugar, and I don't recommend this, but if, you're, if you did that and you're still eating within your calorie needs and you're active and you're eating you know, whole foods for the rest of your diet, it probably has no effect. Like at the end of the day, our overall dietary pattern matters. And if we're not overeating, if we're getting uh, plenty of nutrient dense foods to fulfill our energy needs, uh, having some extra sugar in there isn't a big deal. And for some people, especially those who are extremely active, like people who, you know, compete in triathlons and things like that, they need it. Like if they don't have that extra sugar, it's harder for them to recover. So they'll purposefully add in different types of sugar in order to help uh, re replenish their glycogen stores and things like that. So it, it's not harmful unless it's causing the overall diet to be lower quality. Right. You're not eating lunch and you're grabbing a bag of Cheez-Its from the office break room. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to, that's not going to satisfy you. It's going to give you a quick little burst of energy. And then eventually you're going to need to to eat again. And if you just keep grabbing Cheez-Its, you're never going to get off that cycle. Mm -hmm. And and if you're having a lot of sugar, like you, you're just, if you're eating a bunch of sugar and, and that's comprising a good portion of your diet, you're probably not getting enough protein. You're probably not getting enough fiber. You're probably not getting enough fruits and vegetables. And that's where it's an issue. But if you cover the protein, fiber, fruits and vegetables, and all your needs are met, and you have a little bit of sugar as a part of your diet, that's not an issue at all. Right, right. Don't fall, don't feel like you've fallen off the wagon when you eat an apple, people. Yeah. Or well, a sticker and, bar for that matter. Sp yeah. And and so when I was speaking uh, or when I was speaking about that, I was talking more about the added sugar when it comes to Yeah, like, you're talking about like sugar, <laughs> like refined yeah, sugar. Refined sugar, like, like you said, like a Snickers bar. Like if you had a Snickers bar at the end of your day and that 200 calories was within your energy needs and, and your overall diet was healthy and, and balanced, like that's not a big deal. Um, right. But if it's fruit, that, that's actually going to be beneficial. You know, fruit sugar is going to come with fiber and micronutrients. So pretty much any fruit that you eat is going to have a positive effect on health overall. And definitely don't avoid fruit because of sugar. Um, that, that is not a wise uh, approach for sure. Okay. Well, I mean, a lot of people do. I mean, keto is got to be one of the most widely searched Google terms, I think, in the last couple of years. Yes, yes. It's been going for about 10 years now, unfortunately. Okay, so you're not a keto proponent. Let's talk about the myth about keto. Okay, so um, I mean, the myth about keto is the, 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 the main claim is that when you reduce carbohydrates, insulin goes down and insulin is a, a hormone that, t that tells your body to store fat. And so that causes you to lose more weight. But every study that's ever been done on, on insulin and carbohydrates and, and low carbohydrate diets versus high carbohydrate diets show equal weight loss as long as calories are, are matched. So if you're eating 1,800 calories and zero carbs or 1,800 calories and 90% of your diet in carbs, you're going to lose the same amount of weight either way. 
And that is the claim that people who promote a ketogenic diet make the claim that there's some magical weight loss benefits. And it's really not the case. Now, cutting out carbohydrates and going on a keto diet will cause you to avoid things like Cheez-Its and other foods that are likely not good for your health. And for many people, going on a keto diet is probably the only way or, or the only time they really avoided a lot of these highly processed uh, foods. And so if you do that and you start eating more, you know, whole foods and more uh, protein and more fiber and more, uh, you know, just overall whole foods and less processed foods, you're probably going to experience a health benefit. And you're probably going to lose weight because you took so many options off the table. You know, if you go out to eat, there you have a limited number of options. And any diet that creates a limited number of options is likely going to lead to weight loss. That's how every diet works. They just take away some of your options or take away the time that you can eat throughout the day. And, and then you happen to eat less. And that's how the weight loss occurs. But uh, keto itself going lower carb. There's no value to it, and it, it causes people to remove important foods like whole grains and fruits that are going to provide nutrients and fiber that are important for our overall health. Okay, so I want to talk now about supplements. Well, first of all, this is where I'm a huge questioner, okay? And I tell you what, I had a dermatologist on the show a few months ago. I never washed my face at night, and, and I never wore sunscreen. Well, she absolutely convinced me. I mean, she absolutely... And since then, I tell you what, I've been washing my face every night and I've been wearing sunscreen. So this is your moment. I just get overwhelmed by this whole supplement thing. And I get overwhelmed by, I know I have, you know, gone to my traditional jock doctor in the past and did kind of come up with, with low B12. And so I remember I did take B12 for a hot second. But what, like, let's talk about supplements. The supplement industry is probably one of the most shady businesses in the United States, to be honest. And we talk about, you know, big pharma, like big supplement is worse. Big supplement is worse than big pharma. Most of what's being sold on shelves is absolutely worthless. Oftentimes being sold under false claims. We all we've all seen these marketing claims, you know, that you're this is going to reduce your bloating and this is going to, you know, have all these, you know, this is going to help with weight loss. Almost none of these claims are substantiated. Now, there is good evidence for the use of a variety of different supplements in specific cases. Like you mentioned, if you have a B12 deficiency, taking B12 can be helpful. If you're not eating a lot of magnesium or you're not absorbing magnesium for a specific reason, taking magnesium can be helpful. And there's many different cases where you know a supplement may be helpful for this specific person under these specific conditions. But the way that supplements are generally marketed is they're marketed to general populations, they're marketed through influencers, podcasts, things like that. And oftentimes they're marketed under claims that are exaggerated or completely false. And then people end up on six, seven, eight, nine supplements. And supplements are one of the leading causes of liver injury in the United States. Most supplements, over 50% of supplements bought online, don't even have what they say they have in them. And there's many other, you know, issues with just randomly taking supplements. My opinion with supplements is we should treat them like medications. You're not just going to go and start, you know, prescribing yourself a bunch of medication. You're going to go to your doctor and you're going to get, you know, some specific uh, medications that might be useful for, for, for you through an expert. And that's how we should be approaching supplements. We should be very careful about it. And when we do decide to take a supplement, it should be because it was specifically recommended to us by someone who um, is an expert in this field who who identified that you might you, you you need that specific supplement as opposed to hey you know I took this you know I started taking this supplement and it made me feel better you know so everyone you should, should take too. it yeah right. and that's what you that's what you hear on podcast after podcast and on on you know on social the power media of influencers all over the place. you're like I want to look like you I'm gonna <laughs> stop I'm gonna buy that okay uh-huh. so this brings me to lab work and I recently listened to a podcast where she had gotten very specific lab work done uh, and it came out oh she had all of these micronutrient deficiencies omegas oh so she started taking omega three and six insulin and the blood work showed insulin sensitivity and I was just like that overwhelmed me because I just thought, okay, because I have gone to more of a traditional Western doctor and she had told me, 
yeah, everything's fine with your thyroid. But then when I started going to a more holistic doctor, she did more refined thyroid testing and was like, actually, there's this one ratio that's off between your T3 and your T4. You might want to try this uh, thyroid compound. And I don't know. That's where I just get very overwhelmed because both doctors came to me from good sources. And I liked both of them, but they both told me different things based on lab work. Lab work is really tricky. Okay. So our conventional doctors, unfortunately, oftentimes don't run the right labs. Insurance may not cover the right labs. Um, Sometimes there's new lab work that they may not be on top of in terms of the research. Um, But on the other hand, uh, functional medicine doctors and, you know, holistic health practitioners and, and people who brand themselves in that way often use lab work as a way to scare you into treatment. So totally. they, they will run tons of labs. And if you run 100 labs, something's going to be off. So that's that's the business model. Um, I When I came into this field and I first got started online, I signed up for marketing programs to kind of learn how to build a business online. And that's what they taught me how to do. And I was like, I'm not doing this. This is not this is not OK. This is manipulative to people. You basically bring them in and you say, hey, we have these specialized labs that your doctor can't run. And that's usually a red flag. Um, those labs oftentimes aren't well validated. They don't have a lot of research behind them. Things like the Dutch test, GI map, uh, organic acids test, hair tissue mineral test, uh, food sensitivity test, all of these different tests. Um, There's a little bit of truth to them, but the reality is they're not uh, based in very strong science and uh, they're often used more for a marketing purpose of saying, hey, let's bring you in. We have these special labs that your doctor can't run. And then we run 250 you know, markers and something's going to be off. And whether or not that something's off, you as a consumer don't really know um, you're, you're not an expert in this. So that the, the practitioner can explain it in any way that they want. And oftentimes they're doing it in very misleading ways. And, and I did, as I mentioned, I did some marketing programs and trainings around this. And uh, I was frankly disgusted by the way that, that they that this industry works. And I had no idea, uh, you know, and I work in this industry, I had no idea that, that you know, a lot of the uh, these approaches were, were done in this way for specifically just to kind of pull clients in and, and get people, you know, to think something's wrong with them. Uh, if you're if you're an alternative doctor or functional medicine doctor, unfortunately, not all of them work this way, but many of them uh, work in this fashion where they just tell you something's wrong with you and and they keep telling you something's wrong with you no matter what. And that's how they keep you as a patient. Mm. Well, so what do we do? Because I listened to this podcast and it sounded very convincing. And I actually know of the host and I have followed her for a while and she is appearing a lot more healthy in her own skin. I mean, she did say the primary thing she's done is be consistent. And I'm like, yeah, (laughs) if I was just consistent all the time, then that would probably solve all my issues. But I was curious, like, is it good to go to get tested for omegas and micronutrients and insulin? Like what is good testing then? You know, so, how do we, so yeah. insulin should be done um, through your primary care doctor. Unfortunately, it's not most of the time. Insulin should be a, a part of your your normal uh, like annual lab work. Um, you can request it. It costs like 10 bucks out of pocket. Um, that's probably the main one that I would add on to like the standard lab work. Um, What's and the then standard? I'll, Is it like triglycerides and Yeah, the triglycerides, the glucose. Those are the main ones that we have identified to be associated with chronic health issues. So okay. when we look at like, so say, for example, you did a, a GI map test and they found like some bacteria that was off. We have no idea what that really means in the context of your overall health over a long period of time. Now with LDL cholesterol, glucose, triglycerides, you know, those, it's called a metabolic panel and, and a, a lipid panel, those, those two um, measures. If you get those two, those are going to give you the most information about your overall chronic disease risk. So now, metabolic, lipid, and then add insulin in there. Yeah. If you can add insulin to that, that that's great. Now, when you mentioned omega-3s, there's a thing called an omega-3 index that will give you information about your omega-3 status. Um, this stuff gets really complicated and I wouldn't recommend just doing this on your own. If you're, if you're concerned about that, I would recommend just working with like a, a, a qualified, uh, dietitian who has, you know, experience in that specific, uh, area and, and has expertise in omega-3, 
uh, and, and whatever it is that you, you're, you're expecting that omega-3 might be related to, if it's an inflammatory co- condition or cardiovascular disease, or, um, you know, I, w- I would recommend going in that direction, but, but in terms of like running your own labs, I mean, can you, are you able to do that? I mean, you can't, you can, I mean, you can order everything online. <laughs> um, really? I, okay. I didn't even know this. I, I was super anti-pharma for a while. Um, when I first got into this field, cause I had some negative experiences and I used to order all my stuff. Like I wouldn't go to the doctor for a while cause I was wow. like so anti yeah, I just had some negative experiences but now I've kind of seen the other side because I went you know I went completely on the other side of like you know anti-pharma and all the alternative stuff so I've been there that's you know I'm speaking a lot of this from my own experience of going mm-hmm. through a lot of this stuff and trying this stuff and um, just realizing and learning about the science on why a lot of this is not not really valid Okay, what about like our micronutrients? Is that what B12 and D and yes, all that is? Yes, we cannot test those um, in, with any level of accuracy. Now, there's certain ones like magnesium we can test in red blood cells, uh, vitamin D, for example, we can test. But the status of our micronutrients is not going to be reflected by what is found in our blood because that doesn't tell us how much is in our tissues. And in our tissues is what matters. So blood levels are pretty tightly regulated and they don't, they won't vary unless we're in extreme levels of deficiency. So testing blood levels of micronutrients often doesn't provide any information. Can you Um, get tested for micronutrient levels and through your tissue? So we, we, it would be, it would cost thousands to really get a micronutrient assessment it would be incredibly complicated because we would have to, because then you, if you look at tissue, then you, in some cases, like you have to combine tissue and blood and then tissue in different regions. Like how much do you have in this, uh, you know, in muscle versus liver based on the, the micronutrient that you're trying to assess. It, it just gets way too complicated to understand um, our micronutrient levels. Now, like I said, so when my magnesium, doctor says, B12 was low. You're saying that's not so, accurate. So B12 is one that we can easily test in the okay. blood. Um, okay. So B12, vitamin D, magnesium. Um, there's only a few others that, that we can accurately test in the blood for the most part, though. There's a lot of um, companies that are selling like complete micronutrient analyses where they, oh. they'll sell like a five set to $700 test that claims to assess all of your micronutrients, but they're testing everything in the blood. And it's not really giving a good assessment of of what's going on in various tissues. And it really doesn't give an assessment of overall status. It's complicated. (laughs) Like really every every micronutrient has to be measured differently. And that's what makes it so so complicated. Okay. Gosh. Okay. All right. Wow. This is complicated. (laughs) Um, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. I, and this is outside of nutrition, so you can just pun it if you don't want to answer this, but I've started weightlifting with electrical muscular stimulation. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of this? I have. Okay. What do you think about that? Uh, I, so again, outside of my realm, uh, I don't think there's any data to support that, that there's any additional benefit to that, but, but I'm not confident about that. Uh, so there, there actually could be any, any, there could be a little benefit to it, but the reality is, um, with this type of stuff, uh, for most people, like it's not something that like, let's say you're not going to hook yourself up to machine for the rest of your life and, and stimulate your muscles while you train. So I basically get the benefit of a trainer. Like I'm basically getting directed. I, it's like it happens to be at a place where they hook you up to a machine, but even if they didn't hook me up to the machine, I'm getting the benefit of accountability, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. So um, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but yeah, accountability, support, um, those are the things we really need. We need information and tools and skills around weightlifting, and then we need accountability and support. And anything outside of that, you know, is, is you know, fancy and, and maybe cool and may have additional benefits. But at the end of the day, most of us really need to take on a, a, a regular weightlifting program that's going to be, uh, you know, work all of our muscle groups a couple times per week. That's going to progress over time to where we're getting stronger. And if you're doing that and you're doing that two times a week, the the additional like blood flow restricted training or control eccentrics or all the other complicated things that, that people talk about online aren't really that important. Like, we, we get so focused on, on you know, different modalities and things like that. But 
at the end of the day, weight training is is going to provide the biggest benefit, just being consistent with weight training. Even if you're doing it wrong, you're still going to get a major benefit from it if, if you're consistent with it over the course of your lifetime. So the key is like, what are the tools and, and resources that you need in order for you to become consistent with it over the course of your lifetime? And that's where I would focus energy on is, okay, how, what do I need to in order to achieve that goal? Because doing weight training for a year or two years, it's great. But really, m- many of the benefits of weight training are going to show up later in life when Mm. you're trying to pick up grandkids or walk up the stairs or get up off a chair that's really or or when when it staves off osteoporosis and helps Mm. to maintain your your physical function when many other people are kind of losing some of that and losing muscle mass that's when weight training is really going to have the most benefit so i have heard that i have heard that uh in your 40s especially as a woman it's more important to pick up a weight training routine than it is to just do these hardcore hit workouts is that a myth oh, yeah. or is that true oh i i completely agree with that i'm not a big fan of these hit workouts they don't they don't adequately train your muscles or your cardiovascular system. Um, I'm a fan of doing a couple days a week of weight training and then a couple days a week of some type of cardiovascular exercise. And then you're actually effectively training both of those systems instead of doing this, you know, hit training where you're doing a bunch of movement, but you're not actually training your body. Mm. Exercise is meant to train your body, not to just burn calories. And the hit movements and the hit workouts, those are just calorie burn. Um, whereas training, doing, taking up a weight training routine, if you do that for a year, you're going to double your strength. Mm. You don't double your strength on a hit, you know, doing hit for a year. Right. I can't, uh, everyone's always doing the same, same weights that they were a year ago. They're just going in and burning calories every day for, for a year. Whereas if you're actually weight training, you're going to double your strength. You're going to see changes in your body composition. If you're actually doing like focused aerobic exercise, you're going to see, you know, your mile times go down. You're going to see uh, your your uh, aerobic capacity improve and you don't really see those benefits in like a hit style workout I- except at the beginning. So if you very, it, right, when you very, right. if you've very gone from nothing started, to hit, yeah. it's like, well, of course it's going to be epic for you. The first two months. And then after that, it's plateau for the rest of your life. And that's not where you want to be. Exercise is supposed to like, uh, if, if you can take away one thing from this part of the conversation, um, when you exercise, you know, it should be training your body to get better at mm. something. And if you're not mm. training your body in a way that you're getting better at, at certain things, at, at aerobic exercise or at, at your strength, then it's probably not going to be that effective over the long term. Wow. That is a huge takeaway. I love lifting weights, by the way. I'm so excited about it. And I love just a good, long, hour-long, focused burn, like I can't get through the last rep workout. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that, that's – so many women have avoided it for so long, and that's that's really like the main piece that many women are missing is really you just need a couple days of really in, in heavy weight training because I see it in the gym – 80% of women who are working out typically are stopping too early. Like when you said that last rep should be should be really, really difficult. And if it's not, then you're probably not training yourself to improve. And that's where you'll just plateau for a while. And, and Which is where the HIIT workouts don't. I mean, like I, yeah, I've, you've kind of, now that I've gotten into serious weight training, I'm like, oh my God, the HIIT workout is pointless from a weight <laughs> training perspective. Yeah, definitely. And, and um, weight training is, there's a lot of women have trouble because it's hard. I mean, it's hard going into it. Like it feels uncomfortable. It, it's not, you, sometimes like the weight, you know, lifting weights that you're burning and it's, you know, it's not normal. You're not, it, it feels weird when you first do it. Um, but getting past that, once you get past that, I have, I've worked with many, many people. I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of people. I, I can't tell you how many people I've seen get past that hump and been like, oh my God, I love this. This is changing my life. Like I will never stop doing this. And I love seeing when, when people get to that point. And that is a high percentage of people when you have the right support and you get some knowledge and, and you just feel comfortable in the gym, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. It's fun. Okay. I want to end talking about, I noticed that you, what I think you call calories energy. So I, I'm like, what, how do you kind of calculate that energy range that your body needs, especially if you're a bit overweight and maybe you're trying to lose a little bit of weight and then macro 
nutrients. Okay. There is so much out there about, and I'm just like, that overwhelms me as well. Yeah, definitely. So, um, yes, I do use the term energy for calories because that's what it is. You know, calorie Mm. is a unit of energy and we all look at calories as like some bad thing. And the reason I like to use the word energy is because terminology matters. And if you're not eating your calories, you're not eating energy for the day and you're not fueling yourself. So I want people to take a different approach from a mental standpoint to, you know, your food. You're supposed to be eating. You're supposed to be giving your body energy. You just got to give it the right amount. And uh, on that, like you mentioned, um, how to calculate that, there's a website called NIH Body Weight Planner, and there's many other tools out there, but this is just one of the ones that I like to use. And on that website, if you type in your information, you type in your goals, you type in your, um, all, and, and I have a tutorial on this on my Instagram uh, on exactly how to do this, but if you type in all of your information, it'll spit out your calorie needs. And I highly recommend that everyone understands their energy needs, even if you're, um, you know, in a healthy weight or, or you're not trying to gain or lose weight. It's just good information to understand. And you okay. think, and it does like the whole basic, like, here's how much you weigh, here's my, because I have a very high muscle mass for a woman, especially. I mean, I am very, like, you should see my caps. Like they're not messing around. Okay. So, and of course I've had to go through a lot of my own body image issues because I don't fit the standard idea of what beauty is, um, according to American culture. And so I even remember weighing in like at a doctor's office, like probably in middle school, because those are the most stickiest memories. And I remember the nurse looking at me and just going, Whoa, where do you store all that weight? Mm Mm-hmm. So then I get hesitant when I'm getting on one of these calculator things because I'm like, is it calculating my muscle? So that it's going to calculate your energy needs based on your overall body composition or and it's it, it's not going to be 100% accurate. These are based on equations, these are based on averages, but for you like if you if you have a higher body weight, you have higher energy needs. It's that simple. Mm. And so um, what, what a lot of people find, and this is the reason that I say, I think everyone should do it because a lot of people find that they're supposed to be eating a lot more than they think. Totally. Um, I mean, I used women. to eat 1200 calories. Yeah. I, I can't tell and, you how many women I've, I've spoken to this, like you, you're just supposed to be eating so much more than you think. And especially within oh, meals, like I, I can't tell you, like most people when they're trying to quote unquote eat healthy, um, you know, the meals are so small. They're eating like 400 calorie meals. Like, how are you going to fill yourself up? You're not going to mm. eat. You, Especially if you're weight meals. training and yep. getting your exercise in, it's like it, you're hangry a lot. Exactly. Let's say you're an average size. Let's say you're five five, you know, one forty ish woman. Like your energy needs are probably seventeen fifty ish right there just to maintain. Uh, that or scares even that, a lot of women right now. Yeah, that that would actually seventeen fifty would probably actually lead to weight loss if you're active, and so it would probably be closer to like twenty two for maintenance. Um, do, do, you, you have clients. I have a hard – I am now – I am becoming a questioner <laughs> yes. because I that is hard for me to swallow. Yeah. I mean, this, this is what I do all the time. Like, I, I can't tell you how many – So, and, you literally the, have women eating like, let's say, 1,800 calories, they're weightlifting, and they're exercising, and they're getting to like their sort of healthy weight zone. Oh yeah, eighteen hundred is a low uh, on the low end. I mean, fifteen hundred might be someone that's like five foot one, five ish. Um, if you're like five six, five seven, five eight, you probably even need to be higher than that. Um, you know, height's a big factor. Muscle mass, uh, you know, the amount of activity that you get throughout the day, through your work and through your exercise as well. Um, but most women should not ever be going under fifteen hundred. I mean, you can for a short period of time if you're trying to get to a plateau or something like that, but. Uh, The problem is that most most people and I see this all the time is like they're trying they have the best intentions. They're trying to eat twelve hundred or fourteen hundred every day. And then they have this one day that's twenty eight because they're under eating every day and they're starving all the time. And that's where people that's why people think they need less than they do is because when they're tracking, they're under eating. But then when they're not tracking on the weekends or at night, when they're starving and they're ready, like you're just starving because you only ate. 1200 calories that day. So you eat 1800 at night, you know, in one sitting and, and you just forget about that the next day and tell yourself that you're not losing at 1200. You know, the reality is that uh, usually when someone thinks that they're eating 12 and not losing, it's because you're starving all the time and you're binging and you're probably not paying attention to those binges and how much calories you're getting from that. And when you eat meals and you feed yourself appropriately, you're not starving all the time. You don't have any desire to snack or binge or do any of that. And so you can stay at that 
actual calorie level and you oftentimes average less for many people than they were. And then you can remain consistent because you're actually exactly. feeding yourself. Listen, I had my functional medicine doctor who I'm actually in the – and I mean been with her for years – Mm-hmm. And she just said, yeah, Jessica, I mean, in your 40s, you got if you want to lose weight, you're going to have to eat about 1,200 calories a day. That's just how it works in your 40s. No. And that's when I was like, I think I probably need to start looking for someone else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the functional medicine doctor doesn't get any nutrition training at all. Yeah, like, you're right. Like that's they, probably the missing piece there. Yeah, they, they, get, they get a weekend uh, seminar on each system beyond what an MD does. Like it, they have they have very little training. Most people don't realize this. Like a functional medicine doctor has six weekends of training beyond an MD. And each weekend is like a GI lesson where they just teach them protocols on how to how to fix GI issues. And uh, those protocols are often, you know, they're very generic and they don't work all the time. Most of my clients come from functional medicine doctors, like most of them. Like I'd say probably like 60 to 70% used to were working with like a functional medicine doctor and realized that they weren't moving in the right direction with their health, um, you know, with, with that. But yeah, 1,200, I mean, how tall are you? I'm 5'5". Five five. Yeah, I mean, 1,200, you, you, if you... If oh, you I mean, I used tw- to be able to do that when I was had a dieting problem. And trust me, I mean, I've gone through so much inner healing. I mean... Lots of inner healing. I did my first diet when I was, you know, second grade Weight Watchers. Oh, like wow. I said, yeah, I've got. Maybe we should work together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, wow, that's. A, that's I a, have a long. I have a long history, and I even I, I wrote a book, Imperfect Courage, and I I uh-huh. I even write about you know just my own story of having a healthy relationship with food and my body. But I find that you're constantly having to develop a new relationship with food and body as you age, you know, and as you go through even different phases and different seasons. So I feel like I'm going through one of those times right now where I'm like, wow, you know, what I needed in my 30s doesn't feel like it's what I need in my 40s. And then it just kind of it just depressed me. It it made me feel kind of like what's, you know, almost ambivalent where you're like, well then how, why even try to be healthy if that's what it's going to take to get off some of the extra weight that I do have on right now, I think as a perimenopause, I think because I stress ate this last year because it was a stressful year. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's all the things. Yeah. So, um, the, I mean, there's very real truth to the fact that being in perimenopause can definitely affect hormones and can definitely affect body fat distribution, can affect energy levels, can affect movement. You know, it can, it can definitely make it harder to lose weight to where, yeah, you probably would have to go a little bit lower in calories if you wanted to lose weight. But the reality is that sometimes, and a lot of people don't like to hear this, but sometimes there are phases where, you know, you just, it's just not the right time for you to be right. losing weight. Absolutely. And, and focusing on, you know, the, the other aspects of your health that you can control at that period in time totally. is a better place to focus your energy. And oftentimes when people do that, and you forget about weight loss and you stop thinking about it, then some of that body it's fat so starts true. to come off once you I think that's one of the best thing I've focus. done is just like I hardly ever weigh myself, you know? I, and then when I do, it's just like a little data point. Like, okay, this is one data point. But yeah, just focusing on what do I have control over? I, control, I have control over how much I can move my body. I have control over eating whole foods, which when I'm eating – and then I have a lot of control over my, my mindset. And that is – learning how to consciously tune in before I eat food, check in with myself. Am I emotionally eating right now? Or is this actually true hunger? You know, what are some other calming things I can do to calm my nervous system when I know I'm going to the crunchy chips because I just want chips right now, you know? And, you know, maybe I can start eating jicama or maybe I can go on a walk. And yeah, it's just, it takes a lot of effort to be a healthy human. Definitely. Or sometimes just eat the chips. Eat the uh, you chips. Know? You're right. And, and you're right. It, I, and you're, you're right. It does take a lot of effort, I believe, at first until you get into a really good groove of things. Like, I mean, it does take effort. Like, of course, like with anything, if you want to be successful in life with anything, it's going to take effort. But the effort should go down over time. Like it should be you should get into right. more of a routine over time. And, and there are going to be transitions in your life, like you're mentioning, where you know, maybe effort has to go up because you're trying to get into a new routine uh, for various reasons. But but um, one of the things that I talk about as well on, on my social media is that uh, if you're getting quality information about nutrition, things should feel easier for you. You should gain mm, clarity over time and right. things should become much easier for you. And it, sh- it should 
take up less of your mental headspace totally. over time. And if that's not the case, then your information is probably not high quality and it's probably just meant to distract you. Um, because so a true. lot of, yeah, a lot of the information online is meant to, I mean, we need listeners. You know, if you're trying to run a business, you need listeners. So you have to, you know, keep coming up with new stuff to keep people interested in your content. And uh, unfortunately, in the nutrition space, that means, you know, talking about this, the new fad and the next best thing, instead of focusing on what really matters. And you should, uh, if you're not gaining clarity with your nutrition over time, and you're not just feeling more comfortable about what you're doing, uh, I recommend, you know, examining the sources that you're getting your information from and, and really making sure that, you know, you're, you're getting quality information that's, that's helping you really learn about your body and what it needs. Mm, so good. It's just, it is simple. I do a lot of work around the world. I work with vulnerable populations of people in many parts of the developing world. And whenever I'm there, I'm just like, oh my gosh, the energy we spend on the garbage <laughs> that we do in America when in many of these other places, it's just like, oh my God, you know, they're just trying to get by, you know, and trying to figure out how to grow their food and get the right nutrients and first world problems. <laughs> like first they world say, problems. You know, we, we, we create these first world problems, but when it comes to nutrition, um, yeah, it's, we, we need to move away from that and, and, you know, just really pay more attention to, to ourselves and what, what we feel good eating. And, and, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. It really right. doesn't. Right. Oh my gosh. This was so good. It was so good that we went way over time and I don't care because this is such an area that needs to be demythed for so many people. So thank you so much. Tell us how we can come and get good health information. So uh, the place that I'm most active is on Instagram at Dr. Adrian Chavez. So that's D-R period Adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N period C-H-A-V-E-Z. I also have a podcast called the Nutrition Science Podcast. I truthfully haven't published in a while on it, but I've been getting interviewed on podcasts recently and it's scratched my itch of wanting to get back into the podcasting world. So I will definitely be back on that very soon. Um, and that'll be another really, really good resource where you can go a little bit more in depth. But uh, Instagram is where you can kind of find how to work with me and, and all the different resources from there. So highly recommend checking me out there. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Our music for today's show is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. And I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared. Scared.